Hi, I'm Scott Bollier, director of the Johnson Center at Troy University and host of eConversations. Thank you for tuning in tonight. On tonight's show, we have a very special guest uh, in studio, James Stacy Taylor. He's a philosopher at the College of New Jersey who specializes on issues related to autonomy and also uh, uh, trading and exchange in markets that some of us might find um, questionable, uh, in, in, in markets where people maybe shouldn't be trading. He, he looks into these areas and uh, examines whether or not there's a moral and ethical case for allowing trading in these areas. Uh, James, thank you uh, for being here and uh, joining us. It's, it's very important uh, to have you here uh, because our center's uh, a center committed to economic freedom and free exchange and your work in philosophy seems to be kind of pushing um, how far and how free people should be open uh, to exchange. Um, you know, and, and we're never quite sure where that line should be, what should be tolerable and permissible exchange and what shouldn't. So your, your work is extremely important to our center, uh, which is really about economics, but you're a philosopher doing work right at that frontier. So it's exciting to have you here. Uh, in tonight's lecture to the uh, public at six, you're going to be talking about um, one of these areas where we should be pushing and allowing for more exchange, and that involves human organs and um, whether or not it's appropriate for people to be um, free to trade, buy, and sell organs. Uh, this, I'm sure to someone who's a non-economist, sounds um, crazy <laughs> uh, to, to allow people to um, have surgeries and give up an organ. Um, I, I, I first, I guess, want to know um, what got you into this area and uh, you know, what is this moral case um, for allowing exchanges like this? Well, I think what got me into the area was the realization that there's a lot of people in the United States and elsewhere who are in desperate need of an organ. So, for example, I believe 17 to 18 Americans die each day as a result of not being able to secure an organ that would fit their particular body type. And many more are condemned to having to undergo constant dialysis if they have end-stage renal disease or to undergo various other intrusive tests or have their lives compromised by organ failure. And it struck me that just as in every, any other market that is legalized, if you have a legalized market for human organs, many more will actually become available and we can save people's lives. And I think that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> it would help to alleviate the shortage by compensating people um, for giving these up. I'm assuming that a lot of the effect would be people who are inclined to not donate their organs um, now say, I want my organ if I were to die and there were a way to preserve my organs, I want it donated and the money to go to my next of kin. Or are you imagining you know, like a, a, a warehouse for organs that people can come to and just sell them and then if the price gets low, they can buy an organ and put it back in? Well, <laughs> it Both? Wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't really be a warehouse for organs. Uh -huh. I'm imagining all sorts of different market transactions mm -hmm. because I think that people are highly innovative and inventive and will figure out really good ways to have markets. I primarily defend a market whereby somebody say, you want to earn more money than you do as a professor of economics at Troy. Mm -hmm. So you go to say Kidneys R Us, which will actually be run by your local hospital and you bargain with them, they offer you a certain amount for your kidney, you undergo precisely the same sorts of medical tests as a kidney donor would undergo today, and then you sell them their kidney, sell them your kidney, assuming that your kidney is actually valuable enough for them to purchase. Mm -hmm. So you're in good health, you're not diseased, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be wonderful. It would increase the number of organs that become available, and it would also help people like yourself, mm -hmm. for example, who might want to sell their kidneys. In, in terms of the uh, kind of real world mindset on this, I, I can understand the philosophical and economic argument for allowing this. Um, when you look out there at the medical profession and the legal community as well, which is involved in, in, in pushing in this direction, uh, are there any signs of hope um, that they're becoming more open-minded about allowing the exchange of organs? I know that there was one ruling recently that involved bone marrow and people being able to be compensated slightly for bone marrow, but are there other areas where there's a sure. positive change? Um, the bone marrow case was the decision of a California court, mm -hmm. and they decided that owing to the pressing need for bone marrow, mm -hmm. because if we don't have bone marrow, then people who need 
bone marrow transplants, especially children with leukemia and other bone diseases, will actually die without the marrow. The California court took the humane approach, but we need to save these people, and so we should legalize bone marrow payment. Mm. So there's definite steps forward, and there's steps forward for other organs as well. So the American Medical Association are considering pilot studies for allowing people to be paid for kidneys, for example. Typically not in cash, but in terms of tax credits or education credits or being given health insurance. So there's a lot of real world practicality to these, what might seem creepy and abstract arguments at first sight. So what's led to it, uh, to the status quo being one where you can't be compensated for this? Is, this, is it the creepy aspect of it that this, this is just where we have to draw a line and say that shouldn't be left to the market? Or is there some kind of interest group um, fueling a lot of the laws that we see in place? I think it's largely just the creepy aspect. Uh -huh. I don't think there's any real interest groups pressing against this. Okay. And in fact, most of the people interested in this area, so transplant surgeons and insurance companies, are very much in favor of legalization. Mm -hmm. Transplant surgeons obviously want to save their lives of their patients. Mm -hmm. If they can get more organs, this is a good thing. And insurance companies like this because having a transplant, say of a kidney, turns out to be much, much cheaper than keeping somebody on dialysis or medicine while they're waiting for an organ. So there's a lot of push from the interest groups actually to legalize, mm -hmm. and I think that's a good thing. One of the arguments you often hear people make, though, when you say this should just be turned over to the market, whether it's education or whether it's um, you know things like uh, handling um, you know, other things that are rationed by the government is that the poor are going to come out on the losing end of this. If you turn organs over to the, to the person most willing to pay, the poor are never, they're going to get bid out of that market and never have access. Uh, do, you, do you address that in, in your work? Oh, absolutely. The, the issue of whether the poor will have greater opportunity or less? Having a market for organs would be wonderful for mm -hmm. the poor for two reasons. People who are impoverished and want to sell their organs will now have a means to do so so they can actually capitalize on something that previously was something they couldn't get any money for. But if you're concerned about poor people who would just be bid out, that I think reflects a misunderstanding of how the market in human organs would actually operate. So at the moment, we don't tend to have, go on eBay to buy medical services. We are covered by private insurance or by Medicare or Medicaid. So if you need an organ transplant now, you don't break open the piggy bank and go out and try to purchase a surgical team and secure an organ. Rather, what you do is you go to your insurance company, you go to Medicare and you go to Medicaid, and they'll pay for the operation themselves. You might have co-pays and so forth, but the operations which are extremely expensive are currently accessible to the poor. Allowing a market will actually help the poor greatly because many more organs will become available. And so because the government in part will be purchasing them for distribution to needy people, like everybody else, the poor will actually benefit as potential recipients of organs. And I think that's a really good thing. Yeah. And the, the truth be told, there is a black market in organ trading right now. And I, I'd assume much like other markets where you bring something above ground like alcohol, that would essentially dry up if, if countries were to go in the direction of uh, allowing trading in organs. Um, oh, absolutely. At the moment, we have essentially 1920s, 1930s prohibition mm -hmm. style, but it's against kidneys. Yeah. And just as the prohibition era resulted in gangsters and low quality alcohol and people, innocent bystanders, getting shot, mm -hmm. so too does, does the ban on kidneys result in precisely these problems in the areas of the world where the black market is prevalent, such as India. Pakistan, and even to an extent Hoboken, New Jersey, mm -hmm. where a kidney trafficking ring was recently exposed. Wow. Um, one of the surprising things to me when I talk to you about your work and read um, about some of your writing is that uh, a very unfree country is one of the, um, you know, kind of path breakers in showing us what a market for organs can do, and that's Iran. Um, can you talk a bit about uh, what what's going on there that's working uh, oh, well. Uh, Iran is wonderful. <laughs> you wouldn't normally think of Iran as being a bastion of liberty and yeah. freedom and free market capitalism. But Iran is actually one of the trailblazers in the kidney trade. They legalized the market in 1988. And in the year 2000, they became the only country in the world not to have a waiting list for kidneys. <laughs> 
Now, as of today, they do have a waiting list again, but it's a wasting, waiting list of people who are trying to sell their kidney to the Iranian government or to the non-government organizations that organize these transfers. And I think that's fantastic. Yeah. You, you talk a lot about kidneys. Is that the one that is like the lowest hanging fruit in terms of trying to get a uh, positive change on? Or uh, I'm assuming you'd prefer organ trading in all of the different uh, organs, but um, because we have two kidneys and because there's uh, all of these costs of dialysis, is that the one where uh, right. a lot of your energy is targeted? Yeah, kidneys yeah. are a really practical organ. Mm -hmm. So we have, as you mentioned, black markets in kidneys, mm -hmm. so we know that people are willing to trade. And the American Medical Association is interested in using markets or market type institutions to secure more kidneys. Mm -hmm. So kidneys are for really where the action is, practically speaking. Mm -hmm. But you're right, I'm very happy in extending my arguments to all sorts of organs, mm -hmm. such as corneas, lung pairs, even hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of extending your argument, it seems like there's obvious extensions between tradable organs and say um, other markets where there are significant shortages or significant black markets that are present. Uh, just to name a few, uh, the war on drugs uh, seems like an example where uh, there are, on the one hand, massive shortages, and uh, on the other, a lot of black market activity if you need the product, and a lot of unpredictability as well. So it's the equivalent in some sense of just seizing an organ from someone in a bathtub uh, going on in the, in the drug market. Um, you know, people who want to have a child who are unable to um, have to wait many years sometimes for an adoptee or the right adoptee. Uh, this seems like an area where maybe a market could apply. Um, are these, these areas you're oh, willing to, to go into and say, yeah, I think there should be markets here? Or is, is there a line that you draw and say, mm, buying of babies, I'm not so sure well, about. I think, I think we should be allowed to buy and sell drugs. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this isn't, isn't to say that using hard drugs like cocaine and heroin is a good thing. Yeah. I think, in fact, you'll probably ruin your life if you go down that part, mm -hmm. path. But I think the rational adult should be allowed to make those decisions for themselves, mm -hmm. just as we allow people to make decisions with which job they take, which is an important decision, whom to marry, an important decision. I think people should be allowed to decide what to put into their bodies. So we should legalize drugs just as I think we should legalize kidneys. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned markets for babies. Now, I don't think that people should really be allowed to literally buy and sell babies, but I think they should be allowed to buy and sell the right to bring up a child as their own. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we're talking about commercializing adoption. Mm -hmm. We have adoption now. We don't think there's anything wrong with it. In fact, mm -hmm. we think it's morally laudable. So I think we should just commercialize that end of things also. Mm -hmm. um, these. Uh these ideas you're advancing uh, sound, you know, very, very libertarian in their nature. Uh, people should be free to choose uh, kind of their own uh, paths in life, and um, that freedom really should end where um, someone else is being impeded. You know, where where my nose mm -hmm. begins, uh, essentially. Is that is that where you define the line? Then is you know any exchange uh, can be tolerated. Um, you know, say the exchange of. I know you've talked about even like say buying and selling votes uh, in an election, which I'm sure many people would find uh, reprehensible. You know, right. you're, you're selling who you're voting for. Uh, that seems just inconceivable to a lot of people. But in in your mind frame and your mindset, it's not hurting anyone else, and that's oh, that's absolutely. the key to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that the what we might call the harm principle mm -hmm. really is the key to this. If your actions don't harm anybody else, then you ought to be allowed to do them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually one of the glories of America, that America is built on freedom and opportunity. Mm -hmm. And allowing people to act as they wish without harming others is precisely what I think America is all about. Mm -hmm. And I say this as somebody who is attracted to America precisely because of that freedom. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned vote markets. I think that people should be allowed to buy and sell their vote. Mm -hmm. I think that the chance of one individual vote actually changing an election is pretty close to zero. The only way that your vote for whoever you vote for will actually get that person into office will only occur if there's a difference between your candidate and their rival of one vote. So your vote as something to change elections really isn't that valuable to you. If we allow markets in votes, 
you could now sell your vote to the political party you would have otherwise had to give it to. So they still get the vote that you would have cast anyway, and you might get 10 bucks or a beer or something like that. And as somebody from Scotland, I think getting a beer for a vote is a, a wonderful thing. I, I agree, and I'm from America. <laughs> uh, let's, let's continue a little bit with uh, this discussion of the harm principle and link it back to more of your work um, dealing with, uh, let, let's call it medical ethics. Um, if you take this position that you should be free to do things that don't harm other people, uh, it has some pretty radical implications for, um, say, end of life treatment of, uh, of patients in hospitals and what information they should be uh, granted when they're, when they're near the end of their life and um, what levels of experimentation they should be allowed with drugs when, say, they're down to six months mm -hmm. of life. Uh, I, I'm assuming all of these things, it's, the answer is give them as much freedom as, uh, as, as possible. Freedom even um, to possibly end their life. Does it extend that far? Absolutely, yeah. it does. Okay. If somebody is, it has a terminal illness, mm -hmm. they're in constant pain, they're having to pay perhaps for their palliative care, they're paying for their medical treatment, mm -hmm. and so they're not going to be able to leave very much to their children. Mm -hmm. I think people should be allowed to decide to end their life if they so wish. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I think that's a very important right, mm -hmm. because otherwise you have the government or the state telling people you have to live in this situation, even if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that comes worryingly close to me, to governments telling people essentially that you have to remain alive, you have to live like this, mm -hmm. even if it's not something you want to do. And that strikes me as being very similar to essentially the government enslaving people mm -hmm. and keeping them alive in a situation they don't want to be in. Yeah. Um, you've been highly critical of the FDA too and some of the uh, costs of being so cautious uh, in terms of the drugs that they finally release and how, how long it takes mm -hmm. to release them. Um, what, what is the free market solution to um, the FDA and regulation of drugs? Surely you don't want people just taking anything they want to take uh, when it comes to medicine or is that or would you be comfortable with that i i think i personally i think it would be unwise for mm -hmm. people to take anything they want to take yeah. because somebody who doesn't have medical training might not know how drugs interact mm -hmm. and they might make their lives worse off but one of the things that i think is wonderful about people is they're aware of that mm -hmm. and i think people should have the opportunity to decide to take the drugs that they want recognizing that most people will actually seek the advice of pharmacists mm -hmm. or physicians or even just go online to find out themselves mm -hmm. what sort of drugs reactions they can expect with the pharmaceuticals that they're planning on taking. Yeah. Um, coming back to uh, some of your, your recent work and, and the blogging that you do too, you, you're a member of a uh, blog called a Bleeding Heart Libertarian. Now what's the bleeding heart part of this? Is it just this this fact that you um, are particularly concerned about the poor and their lot. I, uh, libertarian's a word that a lot of people don't, uh, right. aren't, aren't, aren't familiar with, I would guess. And then you've attached bleeding heart yeah. to your particular uh, libertarianism. So libertarianism is the political philosophy that people, essentially people should be allowed to do as they wish mm -hmm. without harming others. It's the view that you ought not to have government intrusion into people's private lives. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have governments telling businesses what they can and cannot do with voluntary consent in adults. Mm -hmm. Now, when you put it that way, and that's an accurate characterization mm -hmm. of libertarianism, people often think, well, you libertarians, you don't care about anybody else. You just think that the free market should ride roughshod over poor mom and pop stores right. and the like. Now, I think that's a mischaracterization of libertarianism. I think that one of the motivations for many libertarians, including myself, is that removing government interference in people's lives will actually make the poor much better off. Mm. If we get rid of licensing requirements, for example, in Louisiana, you have to be licensed to be a florist. Mm -hmm. Get rid of that regulation. And now you can have people who previously couldn't afford the long and arduous training to become licensed florists mm. being able to compete on equal grounds with others. And I think that's wonderful. Yeah. So bleeding heart libertarians are people who think that people should be allowed to do as they wish. And part of the motivation for this is precisely out of concern for the economic well-being of the poor. I think you're on really strong uh, economic footing too in making that argument. Because if you look at data on where would a poor person most want to live, 
uh, it seems to me it'd be in a freer society. Mm -hmm. um, it, the data is pretty clear that there are a lot of different ways to live, um, but if you want to be poor, um, be someplace that's free and you at least have a chance mm -hmm. uh, or an opportunity. And um, that's that's particularly interesting. In the in the um, discipline of philosophy, are you a pretty rare bird in terms of your um, your political disposition and your philosophical bend um, relative to your your peers in economics? It's not um, it, it's uncommon, but not terribly uncommon to find someone who believes in economic freedom and in fairly limited government. Is that is that true in philosophy too? I or? think it's less true in philosophy. Uh -huh. Most philosophers are more inclined to be in favor of regulation, to be inclined to favor government intrusion in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Not because they're particularly in favor of the state necessarily, mm -hmm. but I think it's because they don't really understand the economic principles at work. And they think that state intrusion is likely to make people better off. Mm -hmm. I think that when you actually look at the data and the facts, you discover that's not so. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that a lot of my philosoph philosophical colleagues, they took more economics classes, might be more inclined to a freer society rather than a less free society. We're, we're always told that uh, as economists we need to take more philosophy and that uh, we just don't understand um, the, the great philosophical uh, uh, discussions that are um, taking place. One of, your, one of your themes, the themes of your work um, that I think underpins all of this applied work that you've been doing is the theme of autonomy. and. Um, I think that's one of the core messages of all the work you're, you're doing on mm -hmm. organ trading and on toxic trading in general, as you describe it, is this idea that people should be free. Um, and does that, does that freedom um, extend to, uh, you, you've said it extends to, say, giving up your life at the end of your life, but does it extend into things that we're probably really uncomfortable with, like, say, selling our body, prostitution? Um, oh, is that absolutely. something you'd be uh, comfortable with, too, in, in, in your <laughs> paradigm? <laughs> when you say comfortable with, you mean, <laughs> is that something I'd be in favor of exactly. allowing? <laughs> yes. Yes, I think that yeah. I'm in favor of allowing prostitution. Mm -hmm. Now, as with many things that I'm in favor of allowing, that doesn't necessarily mean that I think it's particularly necessarily a good way to go about living your life. Mm -hmm. But I think that people should be allowed to do all sorts of things mm -hmm. that I might not necessarily myself enjoy doing or even want to do. Mm -hmm. So I think a respect for personal autonomy should allow people to engage in prostitution if they so wish. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a rights-based defense that you're making then, right? Just a, you, a, a person is free to be free, uh, even if this, the consequences of this could turn out uh, badly for them uh, in an individual particular case, right? It's not, you're, you're not grounding it in a, in a, this person needs to be free to be a prostitu prostitute because the consequences for the world are gonna be really, really good. I think it can be a combination of the okay. two. So I think that people should have the right to do with their bodies as they wish. Mm -hmm. Become a prostitute, sell their organ, become a prostitute after you're selling your organ and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I also think that if we have a society which is a freer society, that's going to have very good consequences for everybody overall. Mm -hmm. So if we allow prostitution, maybe you might say, well, this isn't a particularly laudable way of going about things. But I think if we allow prostitution, people would recognize maybe this isn't a good way of going about things, and you might have less engagement in prostitution. Or if you allowed people to experiment with drugs, they might say, maybe I don't really want to do heroin or cocaine. And drug use actually is a very good example of this, because at the moment we have the war on drugs. And this, I think, leads to increased violence. It leads to much more concentrated forms of the drugs, and it leads to people who might perhaps be doing this at a very low level, smoking marijuana, for example, having their lives ruined because they're violating the law. If we legalize drugs, I think what we'll have is, say, Philip Morris or tobacco companies getting into the business. The drugs will be cleaner, we'll know what we're getting when you purchase drugs, you won't have all the gang violence, and you'll essentially cut off a significant source of income for the underworld and for criminals. And I think that's a good thing. My, 
my friends tell me that this is there's a laboratory in Nevada in the prostitution market that's much like this. The the quality is the, much more friends controlled. They're my tell friends. Me. <laughs> Friends uh, inform you about exactly. the laboratory in Nevada, <laughs> and and I think there's some academic yeah. literature in this area that mm -hmm. um, you know there are controls in place for STD prevention and for uh, greater levels of testing, and there's a lot less violence in the market as well. So there there is kind of a parallel there between the the market for um, sexual acts and say alcohol or drugs as well. Yeah, well I think that's exactly right, and we have another so-called laboratory malevolence mm -hmm. as well where prostitution is legalized and regulated. Right. And it seems to be better for everybody mm -hmm. that way. We have just a couple of minutes left. I'm curious to hear um, how your message is received when you take it to um, like a medical community, for example, if we can go back to your organ trading. You've given talks to mm -hmm. uh, a predominantly medical audience before. And w how do they walk away? Just that was interesting? Or do they challenge you? Um, or uh, are, are they? somewhat sympathetic. I think there's sometimes they challenge me mm -hmm. until they become more used to the ideas. But after they get used to the ideas and we point out that they themselves are intending to go into the medical profession for pay. Medicine is a paid profession. People mm -hmm. do it for money. Mm -hmm. But they start to become more comfortable with the idea of people selling other bodily services mm -hmm. such as kidneys for pay. So I think the interesting thing it is, at the moment when we have a kidney operation, a kidney transplant operation, the surgeons get paid, the anesthesiologist gets paid, the nurse gets paid. The only person who doesn't get paid is the person giving up the most precious thing of all, namely the organ. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wrong. Yeah, I, and I do too. Um, for those wanting to kind of push change in that direction, what's, what's the best route to go? I have. Uh, some fairly radical friends who think that donating your organ is actually a step in the wrong direction because you're propping up an illegitimate, right. really bad idea. Uh, is uh, are they on to something, um, or, or or should you know we just be doing the best that we can, make our own decisions, and hope that change comes yeah, in the organ I market think long that term? Making our own decisions yeah. is very important. <laughs> I yeah. think that maybe maintaining yourself as an organ donor, if you are, is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I also think at the same time, maybe you could either lobby Congress or perhaps write to interest groups such as the American Medical Association. Because if they realize that there's general widespread public support for markets, they can exercise their considerable lobbying power and push this to the government in a way that private individuals won't be able to do. Yeah. That's about all the time we have tonight. I really thank you for joining us uh, in studio and look forward to your talk this thank evening. You. And thank you for having me. You're welcome. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in. James will be speaking at 6 p.m. tonight um, in the uh, Bib Graves uh, Lecture Hall. Good night. <laughs>